How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Fundamental Health. I am Paul Saladino. I am here with Sally Norton. She has a master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and she is widely known as really an expert on oxalates. And she was one of the first people that I looked to when I got interested in this topic a couple of years ago. The topic of oxalates is becoming, I think, more and more a part of our discussion in the carnivore world, in the keto world, in the integrative medicine health space. Because I think as people learn more about this, they're, they're discovering that it's one of these under-recognized causes of all sorts of issues for health. And by addressing this, by paying attention to this, people are finding great improvements in their health. And I think Sally has a story about this as well. So Sally, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you. It's great to meet you and your folks. It's Cool opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got interested in this topic of oxalates, and I know you've got a personal story in there, so I'm so excited to hear it all. Okay, well, good thing we have three days. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a degree in nutrition from Cornell University, and I decided I wanted that degree when I was in seventh grade. Uh, and because I, I just really thought it would be so cool if you knew what to do and how to live and what to eat, and then you could be healthy and you didn't ever have to get chemo or have a heart attack. Like, who wouldn't want to have life free of doctors, right? So I thought that would be the coolest thing to learn and to be in a position to help guide people towards uh, eating and other lifestyle, but particularly diet, because diet was obvious to me already in seventh grade, the big lever for having a great life. If you feel great and you have energy, you can have the career you want, the life you want, and do what you want. And without that, you know, life is over, basically. And so here I was off being a smarty pants and going to Cornell and getting a degree in nutrition and um, carried on to a master's degree in public health as I worked with communities and saw that the biggest problem with nutrition is human behavior. And we needed to find a, a lever with how we help people to choose health. So that's been my background, and I have always been a goody-goody in terms of lifestyle and diet. I've been gardening since I was about nine years old, and unfortunately, my mother taught me that I should garden Swiss chard because it's a cut-and-come vegetable, and beets and beet greens grew beautifully where I'm from. There's great soil in central New York, thanks to glaciers, and you can just pop a seed in the ground and be a miracle gardener there. And... Um, I loved my vegetables, I ate a lot of them, and continued to do the right thing and learned about vegetarianism and did that for a while and then learned about veganism and did that for a while and 16 years total with those and then I've been 20 years past that. And when I switched from veganism, I replaced bread and beans with sweet potatoes, which are a high oxalate food and continued the idea that I should be cooking greens and eating lots of vegetables and so that meat went in the center of a plate still loaded with vegetables. And all throughout, since I was about 12, I've been dogged with joint pain, back pain. I had to drop out of Cornell University for bilateral foot surgery, and I didn't recover well from that. And for 30 years, I couldn't go barefoot or wear heels and had you know, sensitive feet that couldn't run or play tennis or anything like that until... Later on, when I'm 48 and I'm really learning the oxalate diet and doing it correctly, within six months of that, I'm wearing heels for a whole day and fine and starting to go barefoot and fine. And now my feet can do anything. I could stand on the very tips of my toes. But that's 30 years of delayed healing with my feet alone, let alone the arthritis and the back issues and the sleep disorder that I developed, which was had ended my career in public health where I was writing research grants with colleagues, um, developing proposals, NIH proposals, which are big onerous tasks, designing research in social and behavioral health. And I just couldn't do it anymore. And it turned out it was because my brain was waking up 29 times an hour at night. And it took me three years to figure out why. And I said, accidentally through all, all my dietary experiments figured out that oxalate was causing my lifelong arthritis had to do this darn diet on top of trying to fix my sleep and all my other issues and oh man one more thing I have to do and I did this oxalate thing 
And lo and behold, I started reading again. Like I couldn't read function, couldn't exercise. And within 10 days of changing my diet, all of a sudden I'm waking up. My brain's coming back. I'm obviously sleeping better. And all, all the stuff that's been bothering me starts to clear up one by one because I finally let go of the Swiss chard and sweet potatoes. I'm like, oh, how can that be? <laughs> I, I'm a health professional. I'm supposed to know stuff. I didn't know anything. It's just blew my mind. They're supposed to be healthy foods. And I mean, you know, I'm in the carnivore world now and I've discovered this carnivore diet over the last year. So one of the things that's been super fascinating to me is the idea that plants don't want to get eaten and plants have toxins in them. And that's why I think the oxalate discussion is so fascinating. I think that of the plant toxins, oxalates have got to be one of the most important ones, if not the most important ones. I mean, especially when we hear stories like this, it's just so striking that, you know, for you, you had arthritis in your joints, you had back pain, you had foot pain, poor recovery from surgery, and even poor sleep. And then when you discovered this, all these things started to get better. And so I think this discussion is going to help a lot of people. So how did you, I mean, how did you discover this? Like, how did you stumble upon this? Like, were you just it's just such a crazy thing. I mean, nobody hears about oxalates, you know, nobody knows that Swiss chard and brassica vegetables and rhubarb and kale and, you know, beets and almonds. And I mean, the foods are myriad and we'll go into the different foods, but how did you hear, what was the, when did the light bulb go on for you? Well, uh, you know, we really have the internet to thank for all this learning that we're doing now. And the the credit goes to a woman who founded something in North Carolina, not far from the university where I used to work, called the Volva Pain Foundation. That's female crotch pain, right? There's a whole foundation that's been devoted to educating people about oxalate and testing foods for oxalate content for 25 and a half years. This one woman has been devoted to this. And so she has a small website out there that came in very handy when my Dr. Google husband, who any ache or pain or concern, he's right to Dr. Google to find the answer. And I had been going through several days of my own crotch pain that was just driving me crazy. And I had this outburst at home. I'm like, oh man, could somebody cut them off because I don't need them anymore. Of course, my husband heard me say, get rid of my genitals. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, on Dr. Google. And he finds the Volva Pain Foundation. I'm like, what's that? I had no idea she existed, and here she was barely an hour from where I used to live and work. And so I'm like, oh, God, now I have to do this too. I'm, you know, I'm trying to fix all these other problems. At this point, I'm not working anymore because I'm pretty disabled with health problems. And actually, no, actually, I take that back because when I first learned about this during that incident, I was still working. And so I did. I stopped eating sweet potatoes and try to change, but I couldn't really see the benefit. That was in 2009. I was like, eh, okay, so the crotch pain went away, so that's done, so that's fixed. I had no idea that it was anything other than that vulva pain issue that oxalates were impacting. So I was like, mm, couldn't really tell, like it wasn't a miracle thing. And so I just thought, okay, now I gotta get back to my real issues and find out why I feel like crap. Um, and so I gradually let a few sweet potatoes come back into my life. And then later on, when I found out I couldn't work at all and I had a sleep problem, I was researching sleep. And the research says it's auto intoxication from things like SIBO that causes the neurotoxicity that makes your brain unable to settle down and relax and do its work at night. And so I was focusing in on gut health because I've had gut health issues since 1990 that just wouldn't, will not quit. And so I thought, well, I've got to deal with SIBO and focus on the gut. And I've already done every single thing I know to do. And that's a lot of stuff. Except this one obscure thing about, oh, kiwis can help cure constipation. It turns out kiwis are full of lovely oxalate crystals that will irritate your colon and help you go. And so I tried eating a couple kiwis a day. It was um, the first year I t attended the Ancestral Health Society meeting this summer of 2013, I was doing this Kiwi experiment while I was at the meeting and just about to take a drug for SIBO and just trying to resolve this problem. And that Kiwi experiment caused me to gradually get more and more arthritic and stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. I was also started juicing celery with some other like lettuce and things. 
And that combination of the celery juice, which, hey, celery juice is a thing now. <laughs> I was so ahead of my time. And, <laughs> and so the kiwi and celery juice just made me, oh my gosh, the, the skeletal muscle symptoms were just getting really bad again. Like back when I was a vegan, I was a mess. It was just like being a vegan again. I was just stiffer and more arthritic. And I was like laying in bed going, what now, God? Why, why, why? And I thought, oh my God. You know, this arthritis is oxalates. I'm like, okay, no, I got to do this oxalate thing for real for the arthritis, even though I really want to fix my sleep, but I'll do this thing. You know, so all along, like everyone else, it's like you start with a bit of kind of like reluctance and irritation. And you feel like, oh, why do I have to do this? And I was just floored that all kinds of crazy things started happening when I, now I was, wasn't working. I could focus on my diet and self-care full time. And it was, amazing what happened. That's so crazy. I mean, it's, it's incredible to hear. I mean, arthritis, sleep, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is something I've talked about a little bit on this, on this show before. I mean, it's so incredible that there's connections between all these things and it was such a striking improvement. So, well, you know, let's just back up and set the stage for people here. What are oxalates? Like, what are we dealing with here? and where are they found in foods and like what's going on? Yeah. Okay. So oxalates is a whole family of potential chemical salts and crystals that originate from the molecule oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is an uber tiny two carbon molecule with a bunch of oxygens on it and a couple of protons. And being an acid, oxalic acid drops its protons and has a negative charge easily. And then not very much more work takes for it to drop the other negative charge, the other proton and develop a second negative charge. So it's a highly reactive chemical with two negative charges that is highly attracted to, or positive ions that are highly attracted to it. So the two of them get together and things that are positive tend to be the minerals. And the thing that seems to bond with it the very best is calcium. So you, you hear about calcium oxalate or you hear about calcium, kidney stones. And when they say calcium kidney stones, they mean oxalate kidney stones. They just happen to drop off the word oxalate because, oh, it must be calcium's fault. So calcium gets like grabbed or grabs oxalate and gets transferred from being a nutrient to being pretty heavy duty toxin in the body and gets the blame for having married. This is like getting in trouble for marrying an alcoholic. Like, <laughs> And so you hear about calcium causing all these problems in the body, but the real troublemaker probably behind calcium, especially um, in the many ways that we find oxalate in the body and plaque in the arteries and osteoporosis happening and arthritis and kidney stones in particular uh, is oxalate grabbing the mineral probably from your blood, your blood or your food because the stuff that tends to get that we're, we're getting oxalate into our bodies principally by food, although you can actually breathe it in in pollution because it forms spontaneously in polluted clouds when we're burning fossil fuels and burning plastics and some of the weird compounds we put into the atmosphere. It can turn into oxalate in the clouds and heavily polluted cities that have a lot of oxalic acid. Uh. Clouds, and if you've ever heard of acid rain, Oxalate is one of the acids in acid rain that's been melting monuments and wrecking the Adirondacks, for example. So you can get it there. You can also get it in cleaners because oxalate is a great grabber of stuff. So it can grab dirt. Dirt often has minerals in it. So it grabs dirt by grabbing the minerals in the dirt and clean stuff. So it's been used in factories for textile production since the 1700s and used to clean all kinds of stuff. You can still buy it as a cleaner. Barkeeper's Friend is an example of a common cleaner sold to the average householder to use on their sink and counters at home. And pe people who are using Barkeeper's Friend without gloves are getting some exposure to oxalate just through cleaning their sink. And you can absorb it through the skin? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh yeah, there's God. problems with agave workers, for example, because agave has not just the acid, but the acid... Um, Oxalic acid forms these crystals because it grabs the minerals and then this is a salt. And if you look at like your salt shaker or your sugar, those are examples of crystals. They can grow into these cool shapes. And agave is full of really pointy crystals that are made of calcium oxalate. 
and it, it causes a lot of dermatitis and problems in the skin of the workers. Just when people are touching it. Just touching it. And these crystals are called raphides, right? Raphides? Raphides. Yeah. Raphides. Raphides. And those are the, that, raphide describes one shape of an oxalate crystal. There's mm -hmm. many, many shapes that oxalate crystals form in plants. Uh, in different arrangements, they can form in tissues. But plants seem to have a way to manage the crystal surface and where it grows and can create these incredible cool shapes. And the rapide is the toothpick. It's very thin and long and has pointy ends on both ends. The, um, the ones we eat in the kiwi, for example, don't have a groove in the middle and are pretty simple toothpicks. But the plant world can make like four or five different shapes of rapide crystals. Those are called phytoliths in archaeology. And archaeologists think they can, can guesstimate what plants we were working with long, long, long ago based on these rapide crystals. So they're very durable crystals. They're like mini, mini needles. They're like little tiny needles that people are yeah. eating in food or working with plants. And they're just like these sharp needles. I know when people get like gout, which is a whole different thing, but um, it's not you know, that different, actually. Really? Oxalate has a role in gout. Interesting. We'll have to talk about that. So, you know, <laughs> gout forms uric acid. And people who know people with gout might, you know, bring this, might make this more concrete for them that the gout crystals deposit in joints and cause a lot of pain. And so what you're saying here is that these uric, that these oxalic acid crystals, this oxalate can deposit in joints just like gout can and form these crystals which are painful or irritating to all sorts of tissues in the body. You mentioned even, you know, uh, vulva pain in women. Uh, you know, arthritis pain, all these things are just kind of the crystals irritating the tissue. Yeah, and the mechanism for the pain generation is probably more complicated than just the crystal right. in the tissue because the crystals themselves, at their very smallest stage, so they start off as a as an individual molecule that grabs the calcium, and then you get eight or ten pairs of these molecules and they form a seed crystal which is a nano size crystal this is so invisibly small and they can grow into these nano crystals and that nano crystal is the same level of toxicity as asbestos crystal or silica the silica is black lung disease right and asbestos everybody's familiar with asbestos being trouble the literature equates oxalate nano crystals to this as asbestos so essentially this is asbestos type tech uh, toxicity to the cells and the cells there's enough of that around the cells are literally in distress because it's causing electromagnetic interference with membranes depolarizing membranes and mitochondria are really sensitive they're just simply a membrane structure in fact all of the biochemistry that runs the life itself runs on membrane structures so anything that's screwing around with the electromagnetics of the membrane which is the energy process that drives all these chemical reactions is interfering with the basic chemistry of life. And so the, the mitochondria start failing and they start producing less ATP and eventually start dying. And its cells get leaky and they say, ah, we're in trouble. And the immune system notices that and comes along. And so ox perpetual exposure to oxalate in tissues creates immune inflammation, which creates pain. So the immune system comes in and tries to remove the toxin. Just like after a mosquito bite, you know, for a few days, you're going to have a red welt that on and off is irritating and painful and itchy and bothering you, but not all the time. And it's not right away. But later on, as the body's removing that insect toxin, it creates problems. And so you can get this constant irritation in tissues that are perpetually exposed. So the pelvis is perpetually exposed because the kidneys are the major route for oxalate to leave the body. So the whole pelvic area, the, you know, the, kidneys themselves and the ureter and, you know, the crotch itself is constantly being exposed to oxalate if your diet is perpetually full of high oxalate foods because you're going to absorb the soluble oxalates, not those big rapide crystals that are irritating the agave nectar workers. Those are just going to act like sand and glass shreds going through your gut, which in itself is electromagnetic and physically sharp and pointy and irritating. So, okay, so we're gonna eat shreds of glass that we won't absorb and then there'll be these ions that we can't absorb or these individual molecules or these nanocrystals that easily float between cells are really tiny. They get into the bloodstream and they often, the ones that come in, many of them are, are a soluble form. And so instead of calcium, they come in attached to 
potassium or sodium, then that's like dropping that old weed. They don't want potassium or sodium when they've got calcium to grab from the blood or, or your food. It's going to end up as calcium oxalate in the blood. So there are so many ways here. They're, they're disruptive at like a macro molecular level in the gut. They're actually probably disrupting the gut lining and then they're getting absorbed. The smaller pieces of oxalate or oxalic acid are getting absorbed, complexing with calcium, forming calcium oxalate kidney stones, like you're saying, then maybe forming uh, larger and larger crystals or disrupting membranes, causing inflammation, causing mitochondrial dysfunction. And this kind of goes back to something that I've talked about before, the fact that plants may be triggering autoimmunity, that plant toxins like oxalate are triggering inflammation. And this is one of these illustrations of this process that when these crystals disrupt mitochondrial function, membranes of cells, and the immune system comes in to clean up, you're essentially getting inflammation and autoimmunity, which I've kind of talked about before, are essentially synonymous. Um, so that's interesting to see that this is triggering this process. So a couple of questions. So in plants, do oxalic, does oxalic acid have a role in plants? Is it does it do something for plants? And then we can talk about, I know in the human body, it really doesn't have a role. It's just sort of a toxin that we detoxify. But what is it doing in plants? Why do plants have oxalic acid in them? Well, um, the plant world, the botany literature suggests there's at least seven roles of, for oxalate that plants can make use of it. Um, there's, they're all really interesting. Like one of them is in the leaf of the plant, the plant can use oxalate to create hydrogen peroxide, which it will use to defend itself from funguses. Mm -hmm. So you're from Virginia, you know that we have these dogwood trees that are very prone to something called powdery mildew. Yeah. Mildews are in the air here. It's very humid and it's getting worse. So we're getting rain all the time. So plants are constantly bombarded with mildews and molds and, and they would just get all yucky because the molds would take over, but they can use oxalic acid to create peroxide and beat back the mold. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Another major use is to pantry calcium because calcium is just a sucker for oxalate. So if the plant makes oxalate, oxalic acid, the calcium is there because the soil is full of calcium and the plant can easily get a hold of calcium and needs to put it in the seed. You got to have some calcium in your seeds so that when you germinate, you've got calcium to run the, the you know, the biochemistry of creating, creating amino acids. So as the cell is germinating, it needs that calcium. So when the cell germinates, it can split off the oxalate and have the calcium. But a nice quiescent form of calcium is to make calcium oxalate. Um, and there's many others, including these crystal shapes. There's a nice little study, a couple of them, that demonstrated that the rapide, which is really, I mean, I describe it as a toothpick, and you had another word for it, but they're really arrows, and they're a quiver full of arrows. The way the plant produces them is in bundles of like 200 or 500 of them, all bundled together like a whole quiver, and shoots these out deliberately to, to penetrate the cells of whoever's eating them. So it can penetrate through at least one, probably two layers of cells and brings with it proteases and soluble oxalate. And once you've punctured a cell and you get proteases inside somebody's mouth, I mean, people think enzymes are so cool, you should eat your enzymes. Oh no, you don't put plant enzymes inside your bloodstream. That is not good. <laughs> no. So you get some pretty um, vicious kind of mucosal membrane effects when you're a plant and you can shoot into the mouth and throat of the eater. And you see this in dum cane, which is a tropical plant that is used as a house plant. And just a simple one simple drop of that stuff can create a huge um, crisis where someone can't speak for four days and his whole mouth is torn up with ulcers that are sort of the immune system's reaction. It strips the tongue and it's you can't breathe because the whole tongue swells up. I mean, your body is going nuts over some of these rapide crystals and the proteases and the other toxins, the soluble oxalate that are delivered through this weaponry. The plants make these crystals as self-defense weaponry to get you to not eat them because, you know, what else are they going to do? They don't want to be eaten. I've talked <laughs> about this all the time. You know, plants don't want to get eaten. And are you talking about, is this Diffenbachia or is it a different yeah. species? The Diffenbachia, because I've heard you talk about that before, that it's the very, that it actually shoots these rapide crystals. That's so wild. So <laughs> plants are using this to defend themselves against mold. They're using it in their own cellular biochemistry, and they're also using it to defend against herbivores and animals that want to eat them. 
you know, some people think they use the crystals like bones. Like there's these styloid shapes, which are blockier, um, you know, like giant bricks or long bricks. And they, they, it may help keep a little bit of rigor in a plant when it's wilting or something. Mm -hmm. So there, there may be some structural um, benefits to it. And there's, other uses some people are proposing another shape called the druse is like a crystal ball it's like plates of of mirrors little square bits of mirror all stuck together into one ball i call it the disco ball mm -hmm. and that might allow in a deep shaded in this shaded area at the floor of say the rainforest there's so little light whatever light you can get on your leaf you want to keep inside your your plant cell by bouncing it around on these druse uh, shape so it's like a mirror that's grabbing light you know so there's lots of proposals but basically plants are good at making oxalate some plants are really good at making oxalate and those that are really good are just known to be poisonous like Diffenbach and you don't eat them and then we've sort of like just assumed that the ones we call food are okay which is so, a big mistake yeah that's a great segue so tell us where are people getting oxalate from in their in their plant foods like which foods are highest and or have any real moderate amount of of oxalate and then in a given day like how much oxalate could somebody get in their diet from these plants okay well um just one correction you didn't mention brassica the brassica family is the cabbage family mm -hmm. in in general they're probably the lowest as a group oh, interesting the cabbage is the very lowest and there's lettuce is really low and cabbage is really low and so there's a bunch of medium ones um there a couple of versions of kale are high and then some kales are pretty low so oh. kale you can't say anything straight about kale other than avoid the curly green dino's okay I don't know why you want to eat that, but you could. <laughs> I don't know why you want to eat dino kale in general. I've railed yeah. against sulforaphane and glucosinolates on other podcasts, so whatever. But yeah, I, well, there are plenty of other toxins thanks to them. And certainly, if you're eating cabbage family vegetables, please cook them well. Cook them well and don't overdo it. Um, plants have all kinds of ways. Even just soluble fiber is hard on your digestive tract. So, But yeah, the high oxalate foods that um, we're getting in trouble with is actually i think the bigger story with oxalates is it's sort of hard to avoid them because there's such a broad array of things that we've come to trust as foods so you've got the beans in general you know the the navy beans the black beans and so on they're really high in oxalate the the nuts all the nuts are high and almonds have really high bio, bioavailability and they're full of other toxins too seeds are crazy so if you love your poppy seed bagel and your sesame seeds and everything or your tahini or these seed butters you know it's a lot of oxalate there potatoes i mean we got now you can eat potatoes three times a day you got your hash browns you got your potato chips with lunch you got your baked potato or your sweet potato fries for dinner and they're ubiquitous and french fries and potato chips i mean they're really a new invention since about the 1950s but now fries or chips with that is a standard lunchtime behavior and potatoes are ubiquitous as are peanuts peanut butter peanut candy peanut bars nut bars if you just are a bum on the sofa and you just like your potato chips and peanut butter you can get really sick on oxalate or you could be a health nut like me and just experimenting with celery juice and green smoothies and get a green smoothie made with three cups of spinach and a tablespoon of almond butter is like a gram of oxalate that's a thousand milligrams of oxalate that's considered somewhere between 10 and at least five times what you're what might be okay to eat so you're eating one spinach smoothie or a giant spinach salad or if you you know if you cook your spinach you take a big bag of spinach down to this little lump on your plate and you by cooking it you're concentrating the amount of spinach you can eat just like with juicing it so you're increasing the amount of spinach you're eating and unless you just really can't leach it out, even though almost three quarters of the oxalate in spinach is soluble oxalate. So that's the same oxalate you would use in barkeeper's friend or an engine cleaner or a, a fabric bleach or a deck cleaner. You could just, as I said on Instagram, you know, you could just clean your deck with your spinach. That might be a better use. <laughs> and I love what you're highlighting here for people. Cooking doesn't degrade it. Cooking will not protect you from oxalate. No. Now, some of the soluble oxalate can be leached out if you boil it long enough, say for your broccoli or asparagus. So 
give them a good boil. But unfortunately, the testing often boils those foods for 10 minutes. The 10 minutes of boiled broccoli is almost inedible. There's no <laughs> point really the point. boiled broccoli for about two minutes, and I haven't seen a test. So 10-minute boiled broccoli, you reduce the oxalate by a third. And broccoli is actually a pretty reasonable food on a low oxalate diet. We, we eat that on a low oxalate diet. It's a great improvement over spinach or Swiss chard. So what are the biggest offenders? If people had to know about, you know, the top six foods that are contributing to oxalate in their diet, what are the worst six? They're the worst six that you eat on a routine basis. And so each person, it's different. For mm -hmm. one person, it's 20 years of buckwheat for breakfast. Mm -hmm. For another person, it's relying on almonds for snacks or using almond milk all the time, mm -hmm. or just being addicted to peanuts. I think peanut butter and peanutty things. Then there's chocolate and there's tea. So some cultures, you drink tea multiple times a day since you're like five years old. Um, and it's, or it's potatoes. It's, it's which one you eat. Nowadays, you can start going crazy with turmeric, whole, whole root turmeric. You can buy it in like these quart jars and start dousing that. So there's lots of ways. It's like every person has their own way of doing it. Right. Um, so you got to keep that in mind. Yeah. I think the, the worst ones in terms of it gets into your body and messes you up are sweet potatoes, potatoes, because they're so common Swiss chard because it's the highest green of all, and that includes beet greens. Beets are really high, so if you think beets are saving you and you're doing them a lot, they could be a problem. I mean, if you love okra, nobody likes okra, but there's probably someone out there who's eating too much okra. So it kind of depends on which food. But I think culturally, our big problems in the U.S. are peanuts, almonds, potatoes, and spinach. Mm -hmm. And now we have this celery juice thing going on. Ugh. Not a good idea. So it depends on the moment in the person, but I, I personally, I think peanuts and potatoes and almonds, really people, let's, let's think about those. So yeah, I guess I would urge people who are listening, if they're curious to look at your website and your information where you list high oxalate and low oxalate foods, and I can link to that in the show notes and the description below. And so people need to be aware of where these are and get a sense of how much they're eating in a day. But I love that you're mentioning sweet potatoes and I'll tell an anecdote about Swiss chard in a moment. But I mean, people always ask me, like, people have a sense, I think most people realize, oh, white potatoes are not good because they're solanaceae, they're a nightshade. But then a lot of people always ask me, what about sweet potatoes? Are they okay? And I say, oxalates, like, they're not okay for a lot of people. Or you just need to know how much you're consuming and get a sense. And we can talk about that. I, I had a raw vegan phase. I think most people who follow me know this. If, they're, if they didn't, I just blew their minds. I had a raw vegan phase myself about 14 years ago. During that phase, I had a juicer, just one of these hand crank juicers that I used for wheatgrass. And, and I started juicing things like kale and chard. And I, I, pretty quickly, I stopped juicing chard because every time I did chard juice, I just felt the back of my throat just felt horrible. It felt like irritated and and, and when I discovered more about oxalates, mainly through you and a couple of other people, I realized, oh, that's just, that's oxalates messing with my throat. Like no wonder chard doesn't feel good when I juice it and I concentrate the oxalates. So scary stuff. So I love that you well, mentioned- Isn't it interesting though that the food is doing something to our throat and yet we're like, well, but it's okay because it's good for me. I know. Like you have to have your medicine, not, not like, oh, maybe that isn't good for me. Like we can, we're so trying to listen to outside sources about what we're supposed to eat. It's led us to this place of intense confusion about food. We've completely lost any kind of an intuitive or any ob ob observational power. Like, you know, you go on a vegan diet and things start falling apart, but it can't be your diet. So it must be the stress in your life. Exactly. Or or you're not getting enough pumpkin seeds, you know, you need more, I don't know, <laughs> meditate, who knows? It's always more. In, in our culture, it's, yeah. it's oh, what am I missing? What do I need more of? What should I buy next? Yeah, it's crazy. And I mean, this is why carnivore diets and ketogenic diets and diets that think about these kind of things are so interesting and disruptive for me because it challenges the mainstream idea that all plants are good or that some plants are, you know, or that plants are valuable or, I mean, I know there may be some plants that are less toxic from an oxalate perspective and we can talk about that, but it's such an interesting concept. And I think it's really going to blow the lid off people's perceptions of plants and where to get nutrients from. And I mean, I've talked about this on their podcast, but I'll just mention it now that, you know, from my perspective, we don't see the same sort of thing in animals. And so I'll just leave it there. We don't see toxins and things in animals that disrupt our biochemistry the way we do with plants. And this idea that plants are not 
wanting to get eaten. And you have to be very careful when you're eating plants. And this oxalate thing is so fascinating. So I love that you mentioned a green smoothie because, you know, I've called Rhonda Patrick out multiple times on social media, doing it respectfully. I respect her work, but I've kind of said, you know, there's Rhonda Patrick's smoothie. And she even says what she puts in. I mean, Rhonda Patrick's smoothie, in my opinion, estimation has six to 800 or a thousand milligrams of oxalate in it, you know, spinach and chard or whatever she wants to put in there. And then it has broccoli sprouts, which are going to have sulforaphane. And like you're highlighting for people, the nuts and seeds are big sources of oxalate. So any nut and seed is a big source and a broccoli sprout. All the broccoli seeds probably have oxalate as well. So the Rhonda Patrick smoothie has 800 to a thousand milligrams of oxalate, Easily. Easily. Which, is, which cannot be good for people. No. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, how much oxalate can our bodies detoxify in a day? You said, you said 800 to 1,000 is probably five to 10 times. Like, I know we get, you know, most people are going to get some oxalate in their diet and we can talk about oxalates being made endogenously in the human body. But like, how much oxalate can we deal with in a day safely, do you think? If people want to like set an upper limit and they want to get a sense of like what oxalate is in what foods, what, what should they use as a cap? Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it? Wouldn't it be great if we had a solid number that really worked for everybody? <laughs> right, right. And I do have a feeling that generally, if you were around 100 milligrams a day, and for most of your life, you'd probably be okay because yeah, your body knows about oxalate, knows how to get rid of it, and excrete it through the urine and other routes as well. But the truth is that uh, it really depends on the terrain. That is your physiology, your state of health, your state of nutrition versus depletion, your state of um, oxidative stress. And, you know, we see that in this very crazy wide range in toxicology, like how much oxalate is lethal? That seems to be as far as toxicology cares about oxalate. The, the range of how much will kill you is between three and a half grams and 30 grams. That's a huge huge range of toxicity but three and a half grams is three and a half green smoothies right could and kill you <laughs> for some people who are exquisitely sensitive well it's not about sensitivity because it's not an allergy but it is about vulnerability or resistance or tolerance right. level and your tolerance level depends on the health of your gut because the a disturbed gut is going to allow a huge, a lot more into your system. Mm -hmm. It depends on your liver because it goes right through your liver and trashes your liver. And if your liver is not loaded with glutathione, you're going to, you're going to suck a lot of that power of the liver to detox. Other things is going to be kind of used up as it's dealing with the toxicity of oxalate coming into it all the time. And then eventually after it travels all over your body, it doesn't happen quickly. It has to get over to the kidneys to get out of the body and the kidneys have, have, you know, finite capacity. So that finite capacity is variable. If you have a lot of sugar, if you're diabetic, if you're alcoholic, if you've used over-the-counter medications routinely, if you've been on prescription drugs, if you've had a lot of solvents in your household or your workplace, your kidneys are relatively damaged, worn out, injured, or whatever. And any injured areas in the kidneys are going to end up vulnerable to oxalate causing necrosis or, or getting stuck there and developing kidney stones. So the like how healthy are you? If you're young and clean and pure and awesome, you might be at 30 grams. But if you're, if you're middle-aged and alcoholic or diabetic or have had to use antibiotics or sinus medication every day, then you, you can't handle so much. Now, this brings up an interesting point. I think I've heard you talk about this and I've seen this talked about on the interwebs. People have died from oxalate toxicity, haven't they? Haven't they? Like oxalis, you know. There's a lethal oral. dose. There's yeah. a lethal dose. And the one I like to talk about the most is the guy in Barcelona, Spain, who at age 52 or 3 had many bowls of sorrel soup and died after two hours in the hospital. And his, his, they miscalculated the amount of oxalate based on the, the weight they gave of sorrel. If you calculate the, the numbers I have that are reliable – he ate about three and a half grams of oxalate. That's the low end of the wow. lethal range. So three and a half grams, that's three and a half smoothies worth of sorrel soup. He died a pretty awful death. So we clearly see this is not a fairy tale. This is not some made up toxin. This is a real thing, you know, that can affect people. So because people, I, I think I want to talk about 
um, endogenous oxalates and how we make those. But I also, I think people right now are just hoping that I will ask you what are vegetables that are low in oxalate just so they can take something away from this. If people, if people want to eat plants, I mean, clearly if they know me, they'll know that I'm sort of an advocate for considering, you know, a fully carnivorous diet. But I, ex I totally understand that a lot of people want to eat plants from time to time. If people want to eat plants, what, what plants would be the safest? I mean, what do you, what kind of plants do you eat to avoid oxalates? <clears throat> Okay, there's multiple questions in there, and I think we need to preface it with an understanding that if you're going to pull yourself away from your smoothie, your spinach salad, your almond habit, your peanut butter, your whatever it is in your life, your potato thing, I mean, I have clients who have a thing over some food or another. They just like have this thing about potatoes or whatever, because these kinds of foods get addictive. It's interesting that foods that are toxic for us or causing us trouble are ones we get attached to as well. It's, it's almost like with the toxin comes a certain degree of addiction to them. But you don't wanna give those up abruptly. You do not wanna go from um, shoveling in, say say you're getting two grams a day, that's you know half of the way, and that's more than half the way to Mr. Sorrel soup death. If you're eating a lot, there, you do not wanna suddenly drop to zero and eat nothing but low or just run to carnivore because that uh, that is way too much trauma in the body you've got loose oxalate you've got this accumulation is happening we haven't talked about that and it's a really critical concept that with routine exposure that's you know pretty con like day-to-day -day exposure not like oh i had blackberries one august two years ago so therefore i have oxalates in my body no you've had some foods with oxalates in them every day probably at almost every meal and in the process of that, you have overwhelmed the system enough that you've got deposits in your body. So if you suddenly shift, all kinds of trouble will happen. We need to come back to this issue. But if you're, if you're gradually migrating away from a high oxalate diet, you want to start reducing quantities and then substituting. Instead of spinach, you can have watercress and arugula, and all the lettuces are low, and some of the other kind of escarole and stuff. So um, seeds, if you got a seed and nut thing, the only one left for you that's really reliable is the pumpkin seed. Mm -hmm. Sprouted, please. Um, sunflower seeds aren't too bad. So if you need some seeds or nuts somewhere, you can actually replace in a lot of recipes, pumpkin seed and pumpkin seed butter surprisingly works really well in place of sesame seeds, which are quite awful and um, so on. What else? Let's see, instead of potatoes, you could try cauliflower, which is quite low, and turnips are pretty low uh, for white vegetables, and actually, um, turnips taste really good, and rutabaga is really good, and you can use celery root, too, and celery root cooked with rutabaga is really cool, and all three of those you can turn into, like, french fries or mashed, or you can do a lot of creative things with those vegetables, and Honestly, they're not horrible. I always thought I hated rutabaga, but <laughs> I got people who just love the way I fix it, especially when I combine it with celery root. So in a way, as you get going with this, you used to get into this culinary exploration and start having fun with uh, some other foods that just aren't cool. You know, this is like the uncool side of the gym. <laughs> <laughs> We've been playing with the cool vegetables over in spinach land, but if you go to the dull side, you know, the boring geeks on the other side are the rutabaga and the turnip and so on. But there's a ton of plant foods that are reasonably low in oxalate and you could do very well. I have people who are vegans and partial vegetarians and things that are doing very well on those foods. I, I do think there is a tendency to get further and further away from depending on vegetables because of this autoimmune side. I think if you're really toxic with oxalates, the chances of your immune system being hyper reactive to all these plant chemicals and fiber, you tend to like do gradually working away from plants generally tends to be a therapeutic path for a lot of us. And you ask what I eat. I have, I've been um, actually a hundred percent pure carnivore since April 1st, but I've had over a year of being, um, you know, like lemons plus meat plus butter plus cheese and raw milk and raw cream and coconut products for a year. I mean, I had, I make vegetables for guests. I, I don't bother with them anymore. Now. And I do not advise people to do that from the beginning. Please don't do that at the beginning. <laughs> Eat a high oxalate diet. Do not do what I'm doing or do not go full carnivore. This, that's a, 
worthy thing to consider trying because the carnivore diet is solving one of the big problems that oxalate causes and that's a huge depletion in b vitamins and i i don't know if it's enough though to solve the depletion in electrolytes and minerals the process of it coming in is stealing electrolytes and minerals the process of it moving around is causing cells to waste minerals that get flushed out of your system the process of getting these oxalates out of your body once you stop adding them the body is ready to get rid of them can cause the wasting of minerals and electrolytes and so there's a need for a lot of nutrients that are bioavailable safe in the right balance in which we don't necessarily know the specifics of your machinery and physiology and so by providing me it's a way to get some of these nutrients back into the system and the, the carnivore the reliance on only meat means the volume of meat and nutrients goes up in your diet so there's definitely a potential therapeutic path moving towards the carnivore but that's not the place to start you know it's interesting i didn't even know you were on a carnivore diet for people listening to this you know i just i was like oh that's awesome you're on a carnivore diet i didn't even know that i just i knew that you were just someone that i would have an awesome conversation with about oxalate so it's really interesting to hear that you're now doing a carnivore diet it's weird to, it's yeah. all of us ex-vegans and vegetarians are like totally like what but april o'hearn deserves a lot of credit i met her at ancestral health in 2017 when i gave that oxalate lecture that helped to kind of spawn the discovery in this ancestral world and the carnivore world was really spawned i think by that talk and and she's been doing it for you know over a decade and she's still upright so oh yeah amber o'hearn is a great resource for people and i can link to her stuff in the show right. notes as well so let's just maybe spend a couple of minutes um you know maybe we can lay it out for people and i love that you bring this up um this is such an interesting idea that a lot of people go keto and they get keto rash and then some people go carnivore and they'll get rashes or they might see acne worsen. And, you know, I think it was you and maybe Elliot Overton who kind of raised this idea that like, is this oxalate dumping? And so this is a whole other nuance of this whole equation. And so I, I want people to make sure that they, they hear your recommendation. People often ask me, should I just go straight carnivore? And I usually tell them, yeah, just do it. But maybe I should say, well, it depends how much oxalate you had. Yeah. You know? And so maybe just walk yeah, us that's through. My, I really, 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 I want to see the carnivore thing be really tested out here and see how good it is as a therapeutic tool. Yeah. But we could be messing up that therapeutic tool by not recognizing oxalate is in the picture. Mm -hmm. Awful lot of people who are willing to go and just meet. I mean, I love to create beautiful meals with all these beautiful colors of vegetables. I like to cook and grow. I have a huge garden. Like, I'm a gardener of me. And like, there's so many, like, I, I would want to see more vegetables in the diet personally, but um, I'm getting lost on this because there's so many tangents that I could go. <laughs> The, uh, we, we need to pay attention to oxalate because of the fact that the people who are doing carnivore are sick. The reason they're doing it is because they got stuff that has been dogging them and nothing else is working. And it's like a last resort diet for the creative, the thinking, the, the people who are pursuing solutions, the people who are not willing to lay on a couch, are not willing to throw in the towel, but they still have issues that are driving them crazy. So they're willing to do this meat only thing. You know, so I think there are particular- Nose to tail, nose to tail, not just meat only, nose to tail. Yeah, I, well, I'm a big nose to tailer. because Gotta I, eat nose to tail. I, I've been, Good. you know, working with agri sustainable agriculture for 14 years, maybe. I, I got an NIH or no, um, a federal grant to interview local producers of animal products in 2004 and produced a guide and have been promoting whole animal purchases. Up for, since then, I buy my meat as a half a cow and a whole pig. And I love it. So I only need to make a few food purchases a year, like fill the freezer a couple times and go visit the farm and have great friends who are farmers and that's simple shopping <laughs> and awesome. it's really great. Uh, so a nose to tail is wonderful because the organ meats in the liver mm -hmm. are like vitamin pills. And I think for the oxalate thing, it's helpful. But again, if we overdo the vitamin pills, we actually empower the body to do this process of trying to clean out. And the, the person who deserves credit for recognizing that oxalate accum accumulation is happening in most of us 
and that when you switch your diet, the body starts trying to expel and excrete oxalate, and it can create all kinds of mayhem and symptoms. That's Susan Owen's work. She's worked with autistic families and studied autism and the biochemistry of sulfates for over 20 years and found herself in a position to help some families get tested and sort of discovered that you can use the low oxide diet to help autism and help the families of autistic children. And in that group, there was all these rashes and funny reactions and just like, oh my, really serious stuff that looks life-threatening and, and is uh, quite scary can show up after you stop putting oxalates in your diet. It's wild. It's really important to recognize because if you go carnivore, you're going to start seeing a period. It might take a year. And I think part of that is because of your nu nutrient status and the status of your kidneys. If your kidneys are a mess and you're not well nourished, it may take a while before the body starts expelling crystals from your knees, from your face, from your teeth, from your sinuses, from your skin. Um, and some people get immediate reactions. I have a client now whose thyroid or, or tonsil area and mouth area is literally expelling crystals that look like those rapides, only they're a little bigger than a rapide because you can really see them. Because rapides are so little, they're basically invisible. But these are like mega rapides. They're long shreds of glass. And she'll get a panicky feeling where she's just completely freaking out. That's the neurotoxicity. And then she'll get this intense pain and pressure in her face. And then this sort of pink and swellingness. And then this crystal will come out. <laughs> it's like the body's literally expelling these large deposits, which is a safe way to do it. And this is the body getting rid of it. It either has to dissolve it down to ions and nanocrystals and move it through your kidneys or just expel it out. And some tissues are so alkaline, they can't really dissolve them anyway. And so you tend to see the whole crystal expelling in the eyes. You'll see people who have really watery eyes. It has the water in the eyes has sort of gritty feeling to it. That's crystalline. Some people literally say crystals popped out of my eyes. <laughs> or getting eye styes or other things after you go on the diet. Getting intense sinus pain. There's a lot of calcium here, a lot of circulation. Teeth pain. People will get such intense teeth pain that just want them pulled out of their mouth that'll come and go. Sensitivity and so on, jaw pain, masseter issues. You, know, you could get all kinds of symptoms after you stop eating the oxalate, just like you get symptoms two days after the bug bit you. You still get the itchy rash stuff. That's the body trying to expel the toxin, the insect injected in your skin. Well, these weird reactions that can happen a year, two, three years after you go low oxalate, you can still have waves of hip annoyance or back pain or skin issues or tennis elbow or, you know, trick thumb or trigger finger, all kinds of stuff. Those are oxalate related often. And they happen whenever the body gets around to trying to clear that toxin from that tissue. So this is awesome. I think let's just, I think let's just, you know, dig into this a little bit for people. I know we're getting close to the end here, but I just want to give people stuff they can use. You know, I think that it's probably clear to everyone listening that oxalates are causing issues and they want to, I think a lot of people probably want to go carnivore or they want to stop doing oxalates. And I love that we're talking about oxalate dumping because I get a lot of questions about keto rash and, you know, carnivore rash. And I think that a lot of these things could be oxalates coming out. You know, it's interesting. I've noticed a sty in my eye for the last few months and I never thought about it. I was like, what is going on there? And now you just made me think like, I wonder that's my oxalates coming out because it, it is. And I, that's one of my major symptoms. And I know when I'm dumping because often they swell up again, an easy cure for that is some regular old coconut oil on the end of a Q-tip mm -hmm. and just run that along the lash line at bedtime and then in the morning and that'll take care of it. That helps to dissolve the whatever's clogging that gland and helps as an antibiotic um, and it'll clear those styes. But I had such bad styes that we almost missed a family vacation and I went to the eye doctor and I'm like, He's given me the, the cream and that stuff never worked. He told me I should microwave a potato and put a hot potato on my eye. That <laughs> more never oxalate, more oxalate on your eye. <laughs> I got some pretty gruesome pictures of some of my styes. They oh my were God. awful. And I'm still, I'm five and a half years past this diet. And I noticed this morning I had another little red thing coming up right here. 
And so there went out, came out the, uh, I'm still using coconut oil on my lash line to, to manage this because the tissues will continue to clean up for as long as they need to. And I think on average, that's about a decade. Wow. So if people want to, if people are eating a moderate or high oxalate diet, where do they go from there? You know, from your perspective, what kind of a time frame should they consider to like taper down oxalates? And, you know, if they get like a rash or, or a reaction, should they just let it go? And is, are there any, is there anything they can do to assist with the dumping of oxalates? Um, yeah, this is a science that needs to get developed because in the medical literature, no one's pursuing these questions. Medicine believes that oxalate accumulation in the body only is secondary to renal failure. And a lot of us have really wonderful kidneys. I've been peeing out crystals like crazy for decades and my kidneys are troopers and they're good at peeing out oxalate and I'm loaded with styes and just oxalates everywhere. So there's very little that comes from the literature. So here we are back to crowdsourcing this. It's like through our experience. That's why Susan Owens has been working with thousands of people for years on her group, the Triangle Oxalate Group, because it's like a group learning process. And that's why I do what I do. My real interest is to understand the science. And the reason I work with clients is that's the best way to become an expert at this is to know people very closely and individually, watch these cases, learn from each person, to be able to step back and have that perspective when we interpret the literature. So I split my time between reading the literature, trying to explain this to people, trying to write about it, and then teaching it, and then working with clients. Because through our collective work, we have to pull together as a community and the ancestral health and learn this together. Um, and then convince the researchers that this is for real and get more dollars and more grants funded so people can really do this work. But things we could do, first of all, you really have to know the diet and move into that carefully and stick with the diet in a consistent way. If you go back and forth, you're just increasing your sensitization, sensitization to you know, unmasking your tolerance or intolerance, I actually think the body gets a little more perturbed after you go low oxalate about when you'd start throwing oxalates back in again. And I think going back and forth is actually not helpful. People will do that to, in order to figure out if it's really a thing for them. I've, I've had clients who kind of fooled around for a couple of years wanting it to not be oxalates. And then they, they keep fiddling around and finally they come back to me and go, yeah, it's oxalates. <laughs> it's like, uh. so if, you can, if you can just kind of, Think about this more or talk to somebody like me or Susan or somebody who knows about this and convince yourself sooner that you should stick with the diet and do that consistently. That's really important. And then we have to recognize this sort of mayhem in your metabolism that has created autoimmune and sensitivities and allergies and electrolyte disturbance. We need electrolytes. We need potassium. We need, we need all kinds of things like magnesium and minerals. And so I think when the oxalates are moving out, it really disturbs the electrolyte balance. You're going to see AFib. You're going to see changes in pulse. You're going to see heart palpitations. That's a sign that they're moving and they're, they're, you're low in potassium and electrolytes. So we need to be watching for those crises. Some people end up in the emergency room with a huge electrolyte crash and T-wave inversion and so on. Whoa. So we have to replace, oh, it's for real. I mean, people feel like they're dying. Those of us who've really overdone the almond bread, for example, I luckily, I never did that. Oh. But if you've been eating almond bread every day, you are in trouble. And you need to be careful and get electrolytes in there. We usually use the citrate form because citrate is very helpful in keeping these crystals from reaccumulating into stones. They citrates lay down on the crystals and, and sort of have this electromagnetic pull, I think, that makes the calcium bonds weaker and allows the crystals to crumble apart easier. So you can just pee your kidney stones out if you have enough lemon juice and citrate supplements and a low oxalate diet. You can just release and clean up a kidney. I've seen that with several people. They just start after... 15 or 16 kidney stones and multiple, um, you know, lipotripsies and all these kind of harsh treatments. They could just use lemons and, and potassium citrate and et cetera. So potassium um, citrate, magnesium citrate. And calcium citrate. Calcium citrate. Okay. Usually we use all three. And one reason is because we like to have calcium in the colon. So we don't want to take calcium with vitamin D or foods that are high in vitamin D, because we're, we're taking the calcium not so much to absorb it, but to use it as a magnet to allow the body to use the colon successfully as a way to excrete oxalate. Hmm. 
Hmm. If you're in an acidosis situation, you're going to excrete a lot more in the colon and see this gritty stools. If your kidneys are failing or overwhelmed, you're going to see a lot more in the stools. And if calcium's there, you'll, you'll be able to form the crystalline oxalate and, this, and, and it can come out through the feces. Interesting. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting because somebody who is in a metabolic crisis and acidotic, you're going to see. So the calcium will help pull it out through the feces. If there's nothing there in the colon, normally there would be oxobacter firminages or bacteria that could consume that oxalate, but at least 70% of us don't have that. So the calcium serves as a way to get it out. It's a binder. So we like to use calcium. What, and use calcium citrate? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all the citrate forms, you probably could take zinc in a citrate form and a multi-mineral, a decent a multi-mineral is helpful. Getting enough nutrients is important because oxalate is um, using up the B vitamins and you're going to be, if you've been in a cycle of high oxalate diet, chances are you're pretty deficient in B6 and B1 and so on. So, so liver, liver and egg yolks. Liver. Now, uh, me and others have seen it. liver is enough to increase your nutrient power enough that it could increase the dumping. Mm. So your body will be more empowered by protein, calories, and nutrients. The more it's got protein, calories, and nutrients, the more vitality it has to push the stuff around. And that is not necessarily a good thing. We don't have any way to know how to control it. Like if it could just happen slowly in the background at a little humming along rate, just quietly, and it could, the kidneys could be working hard in the background and you could be slowly getting rid of oxalate, but that's not seeming to be what's happening for a lot of us. We get into these cycles where you feel really horrible for several days and you get a half day where you feel great and everything's great, your knee's great, your back's great, and then you have a few days where you're like, oh, I can hardly think, I'm so tired. You know, you get these malaise cycles, and for people like me who had all this healthy food so long, the malaise is longer than the good days. Like five days of malaise, one bad day. So you can be quite struggling with this. So it's, you're not crazy, and you may literally need to go part time or take a break from your job. I mean, if you're really sick with oxalate, this is a serious illness, and it takes a while to get well. And so rest is important. I mean, time off, low stress. Reducing oxidative stress, staying away from alcohol and other toxins is important. Getting good sleep, watching your circadian rhythms, don't have too much EMF pollution. All these stressors on the body that increase oxidative stress just makes it harder. Um, getting some sunlight, making sure you have enough sulfur in your body so your skin can make vitamin D. Sulfur is one of these important molecules that affects how well the body can uh, shunt oxalate around in the body. It may, um, lack of sulfur may increase your propensity to accumulate oxalate especially in the glands glands tend to get caught up with oxalate a lot um, as in your eye styes you know because glands as i try to explain glands are like factories they're always producing a product all the time and so they have a big shipping and receiving department and part of shipping includes receiving like they're constantly sweeping in materials raw materials to make their products so Glands, I think, just metabolically are pulling in so much material all the time, they tend to get caught up with oxalates. Now, I know in the paper that you written about that you wrote about the uh, lost seasonality of plants, I'll link to that in the show notes. It's a great paper about oxalates for people that want a resource. You mentioned that something like some astronomical number, like 85% of thyroids above the age of 50, something have oxalate crystals in them. It's crazy. That makes it normal, doesn't it? I know. All right. Well, I wanna... so people have to recognize this is normal. Like we're full of oxalate and it's normal. <laughs> and it's but normal it's <laughs> because of our lifestyle, the, our culture, our diet. Just like it was arthritis was normal in Egypt from their weed and high oxalate diet and problems. Our health problems are normal and oxalate is a big player in our problems. I just want to ask one more question, then I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you too long this morning. In the carnivore world, I've talked a lot about methionine glycine balance. I am really interested in excess methionine and how that's been shown to be damaging. And ultimately, I think people need to be testing glycine levels and glutathione levels. And glycine is one of these amino acids of glutathione, which we've talked about. Do you have any concerns about overconsumption of collagen or overconsumption? So the, the issue here for people is that hydroxyproline is one of these amino acids in collagen. And one of the path, one of the pathways of degradation of hydroxyproline is to oxalate. And so the question becomes, you know, if people are eating a lot of collagen, could it create too much uh, oxalate? Is, it, is this amount of oxalate that someone is making from hydroxyproline 
just small in comparison to plant sources? Do you have any concerns about excess collagen or even glycine through the glyoxal pathway can go over to oxalate too? Any concerns about these issues? How do we think about this from like a nose to tail perspective? Yeah, we don't have a lot of really good answers. Uh, a guy named John Knight, I think his name is John, Dr. Knight is a researcher who's done some work on the endogenous production yes. of oxalate. And, you know, he showed that if you increase just animal proteins in general, you don't see any change in oxalate. If anything, it's almost a little lower in the year, just animal foods in general. But the amount of oxalate or the amount of gelatin that can increase oxalate in the urine, and, and I don't know what kind of patients, like like terrain always matters and right. the model of the study really matters, but it, you know, he claims that something around the amount that you get in a package of gelatin, about five to seven grams, I think he's saying five grams cause oxalate to go up in the urine, mm -hmm. which I think a packet of gelatin is about seven grams. So that's the amount in a cup of jello or a good gelatinous broth, it would be like three quarters of a cup. So right. I always tell my clients that, you know, stick to a half to three to a cup of gelatin a day and you're probably fine. You mean like bone I, broth? I'm a fan of bone broth because my vegan years caused my, my height to shrink an inch and a half. And when I went off being vegan, I started doing bone broth and I got an inch and a quarter back thanks to bone broth. And so I kind of like bone broth. I love nose to tail eating. I think that as a um, top tier carnivore, we have the machinery for handling animal foods. Um, but I do think if you've got an oxalate problem, especially if you're diabetic, because it's really, I think, endogenous production going on inside your body, which isn't something we didn't have time to talk about. But if you're high, if you have a lot of sugar in your diet, then you have more glycated proteins and processing those increases this problem, more oxalate probably in the diet, the oxidative stress that comes with disease and other places, um, and being deficient in nutrients. So uh, you can tolerate gelatin and so on if you're you're not diabetic, you know. So there's this kind of context of the diet. I'd say probably a ton of blown, bone broth for someone who's eating a ton of sugar is probably the worst combination. And every once in a while, people will tell me they can't do bone broth because they think they're sensitive to histamine. And I always wonder, you know, maybe this is just an oxalate thing. Maybe it's getting overloaded. And I think that there are lots of benefits to collagenous tissues. I don't think that's debated. It's just, it's probably going to be an individual basis that people are going to find this methionine and glycine balance. The other thing I'll mention is that for people that have sensitivities to bone broth or collagen, I often recommend just glycine as an amino acid. And I know that glycine can be metabolized, but it seems to be less so to oxalate. So yeah, I'll have to do another podcast about endogenous synthesis of oxalate. My sense is that that's going to be much less than all of the plants that, that you're going to get some and you're going to be able to tolerate. And, you know, you're eating animal foods is going to create oxalate because there is hydroxyproline in animal foods and we probably get rid of it. I'm familiar with his research, um, the, you know, uh, nice research. And what I was looking at recently was that when they did these gelatin supplements, the blood levels of oxalate did not increase, but the urine levels did. So I wonder if it's you just see a lot of change in blood levels of oxalate in general. The body doesn't like oxalate in the blood. Right. This is one reason why it's an invisible disease, because if it was easily tested in the blood, we'd be dealing with it because that's how we do medicine. Everything's about the plasma now. But, it, you know, we've known since 1823 that oxalate doesn't hang around in the blood. One of the earliest studies. It just doesn't. And that's one reason it's not popular in medicine because it's not convenient to measure. It's not, we, it's hard to understand what's happening in the complicated physiology. It so. is a complicated physiology. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. I think this has been an awesome discussion. I think people are going to get a ton out of this. We'll have to do a part two. I think people are going to be super excited to read more of your stuff and to reach out to you. Where can people find you? How can they find your information and learn more about oxalates in general? Well, I have a website called sallyknorton.com. There's a ton of free information on there. You can download my articles from there and you can reach me if you want to have, you know, ask me questions about your own situation. Personally, I do consults and you can schedule it there. I've started playing around with Instagram and feel free to follow me there. I'm going to um, start using, I'm kind of enjoying Instagram. I sort of neglect Twitter and I'm kind of lame about social media. I'm kind of a library geek. I worry about my clients my library studies in my yoga classes and then I kind of neglect <laughs> social media. So you have to forgive me. For that. 
<laughs> and your Instagram handle is Sally K Norton, right? No, the Instagram is SK Norton. SK Norton on Instagram. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So people should definitely go follow you there and they can reach out to you yep. through your website and stuff like that. All right, great. I'll put those in the show notes. Thanks for being here. I'm definitely going to ask you right now. I want to get you back on for part two. We'll do it soon. Okay. Have a- that'd be fun. Thanks yeah. For- I have to say we might need a better expert on endogenous production. I think the science isn't really worked out in terms of the physiology and it's just a lot of big question signs and science. And, and I think again, learning how to just learn from our bodies and there's more to discover just from becoming self-respecting there. But I hope we can continue this conversation for many years to come because there's a lot to learn. It's really fun. I think it's going to be a big part of the carnivore space. And like you said, I mean, I think there's going to be a big conversation in the keto space because everybody I see on keto is doing keto pancakes with almond flour. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is a problem. So lots more to talk about. Well, Indeed. thank you for coming on. We'll Thanks do another one soon. Good to see you. Looking forward to the next time. Bye. <laughs>